The following video was sponsored by the Greek American Heritage Society of Philadelphia, preserving and perpetuating our community's history. Well, let's talk about your name first, Spartacus. Right, so your roller derby name is essentially your alter ego, and uh, Spartacus is a play on my Greek heritage. My number is 300. So needless to say, with a name like Spartacus, there's it's definitely a level to perform at a super high level. We're speaking with Eleni Zarbalas Panaritis, a member of the Greek National Roller Derby team who recently participated in the Blood and Thunder World Cup of Roller Derby. It was the second international tournament ever held. It was held in Dallas, Texas. Eleni, welcome to Cosmos Philly. Thanks. First, let's get an idea about the sport. Tell us all about the sport today. Okay. Well, uh, roller derby is essentially a um, one-hour game. It's broken up into two 30-minute halves. We refer to it as a bout, not a game. And within those 30 minutes are what are called two-minute jams. And uh, just like football lines, we have roller derby lines. And during each lineup, you'll have four blockers and one jammer. We uh, don't carry a ball or hold anything, uh, which is a popular misconception. The object of the game is to get the jammer through the pack, and the pack is defined as the greatest number of skaters. So the way that you score is the jammer, which is the girl with the star on her helmet, gets one point for each opposing blocker she passes, and if she actually passes the opposing jammer, she gets what's called a grand slam or five points. So you try to score as many points as you can within that two minutes. And how did you get involved with the sport? Um, I actually had a friend of mine who was a, an attorney who invited me to go watch her play in one of her bouts, and um, I just fell in love with the sport. I saw, you know, she was all five foot tall, 100 pounds. I'm like, oh my God, if you do this, I could totally do this. And uh, I've been playing ever since. It's been about three and a half years. Um, traditionally, the sport has a different history. Can we talk about the history uh, and how it evolved to where it is today? Sure, so uh, roller derby actually started in the late 1960s, and uh, traditional quad roller skates, we don't wear roller blades. Um, and it's definitely changed in, in what sense? And even in the three and a half years that I've been playing, uh, physically you have to have um, the endurance and the shape of an athlete. You have to be strong, you have to be fast, you have to have endurance. And um, the other part of the sport that's changed significantly is the rules. We have inside pack refs, we have outside pack refs, we have NSOs, which are non-skating officials, which tally uh, the points and uh, they sit in the penalty box. So if I had to describe roller derby, it would essentially be football on roller skates with a hockey penalty box. So you don't get to elbow a girl in the face or punch a girl in the face. There are certain rules we have to abide by. And if you don't, um, the, the purpose of our number is so that the ref can call your number and send you to the box for 30 seconds to cool off. If you have seven penalties, you foul out and you get ejected from the game, just like in hockey. Are there uh, common misconceptions about the sport today? Because historically, like we said earlier, the sport was viewed completely different. Yes. So uh, the stereotypical derby girl is somebody that's jaded or has some sort of life crisis going on, um, full of tattoos and piercings. Um, I, I'll tell you, we, we definitely all have different backgrounds, different professions. Um, and if anything, I like to say we are unlabelable. And, um, we don't carry a ball, like I said. It's not WWF. It's a, a legitimate sport. Uh, we're petitioning for it to be an Olympic sport. And that's why there has been this uh, great growth and interest in the World Cup. The first World Cup was in Toronto four years ago, and Blood and Thunder had this most recent one, like I said, that Greece made their first appearance. We were one of 30 countries in a five-day tournament, and Greece came in 16 out of 30, which is very, very exciting. Well, since you went there, let's talk about the sport. Uh, globally, uh, it's, it's growing. Yep. Is, does the sport actually have uh, potential to become an Olympic sport? Yes. Um, we, we felt this way, at least the roller derby community has felt this way for at least eight years. Um, it's one of the fastest growing sports in, in the United States as well as internationally. So one of the criteria for the Olympic Committee is to determine, determine its popularity and whether it's something that can be done globally. So the World Cup is representative of that. Like I said, 30 countries bringing 40 skaters. You understand the rules of the game. There's interest in the game. Um, it's definitely a lot more interesting than water polo. So we're, we're, you know, we, we hope it will become an Olympic sport. Uh, the International Committee is also having a tournament 
in Barcelona in 2016. And I'm actually working with um, someone at the Saloniki that's in charge of roller sports to make sure that Greece has a present in those international games. And then Blood and Thunder World Cup is also looking, looking at having another tournament possibly in London in three years. So we're trying to get a Greek team together for that as well. And how do you feel you'll, you'll be trying to get involved with that? Is that sort of yes. a future goal for you? Yeah, so I'm, I'm 44. Uh, the likelihood of me playing when I'm 47, I'm, I don't want to, I never want to say <laughs> never, <laughs> but um, I would love to, to coach those girls. Um, you know, roller derby right now, the girls are starting to skate at six years old in these, some of these junior leagues. And I, and I say they're going to be the superstars that you're going to see tomorrow in the Olympics. Um, but I would definitely love to be involved with Team Greece given my most recent experience with the team and the women. You were able to participate on the Greek national team, and there's a great photograph that I saw recently of you holding the flag during the actual parading ceremony. Right. What was going through your head there, and what was it like for you to participate? Um, so the Parade of Nations was the final day before the final match with uh, USA uh, versus England. and. Um, so if you were at the Parade of Nations, you would see 50, 60 skaters for Team USA, 30, 40 skaters for South Africa, and Greece coming out, I'd, I'd like to say hobbling out with 12 skaters, um, because you know the advantage of playing with that many skaters in four games in two days, you get to put your fresh line on. We played every single game, every other jam. So whether you know we were broken, and, and in my case, I broke my finger in the first game, I rebroke it in the fourth game, tore my shoulder in the third game, but it was like, patch me up, give me some ice, I gotta go. <laughs> we have nobody, let's do it. And um, so I, we, we just, we respected each other, we loved each other, and we were, we were really like the Spartans, like the 300. And um, like I said, the fact that we came in 16th was amazing. And I met these girls the week before the first time, for the first time, hi, nice to meet you, we're gonna play together. We were trained by the Texas Roller Girls in Austin three hours a day. Um, we ate together, we slept together, we played together, we hurt together, we were passing Advil and rubbing, you know, you know, biofreeze on each other. And, you know, when it came time to play, we, we came together and we, we definitely shone. We were the underdogs and all of the other countries fell in love with Greece because we smiled the whole time we were playing. We were just honored to be there. So the Parade of Nations, you saw that, you know, that pride. Was there, were there any moments where communication was difficult because we're talking about women that grew up here, yep. that were Greek-American, maybe they weren't speaking Greek. What, what was that like? Uh, well, we had two girls that came from Athens who had never really played in a bout before, and we didn't realize it until we were in Austin, and we talked about penalty boxes and the rules of the game. Um, and then we had two Greek-American girls from different states who didn't speak any Greek. So when we were talking about our lineups and um, you know, I was the pivot, so I was kind of like the quarterback calling the plays. I said, you know what, when we call the lanes, I'm gonna say tessera, tessera, tria, tria, dio, dio, because they don't understand what we're saying and I'll be telling you where the jammer's going. So the, ironically, the American girls had to learn the four Greek numbers because there are four lanes in a track. And uh, the other thing we, we, the other word or phrase they used was uh, dosto or enparto because when the jammer gets tired, she can pass her, her jammer panty onto the pivot and the pivot is the only one that can take it from her. So when the jammer was hired, she'd say, parto. Or if, if the pivot saw that her jammer was struggling, she'd say, dos dos. So we did have that unique um, dynamic. The other thing is that the girls from Greece were 22 years old. You know, like I said, I'm 44 years old. And <laughs> so it was, it was kind of cool because they didn't have the training and the discipline that we had or the advantage that we had here in the States where I train with the local team. I have amazing coaches. Um, you know, they kind of just showed up and it's amazing to have somebody that you know could be your daughter saying to you you know wow you know thanks so much for going out there because I'm too tired <laughs> let's talk about um, future goals in the sport where do you see yourself in the next few years um, I would love to help bring roller derby to Greece um, just having meet these two Athenian players and how new the sport is for them they still don't understand the value in it uh, the idea of a strong athletic woman um, you know, defying being labelable, I like to say. Um, you can do it all. And I think that if you live by the philosophy that children learn what they live, that you can be a positive role model for your children. And as a mother of athletes, um, I think it's important. And, you know, my son Lefty writes 300 on his face and dyes his mohawk red when he watches me play. And he's got 
signs that say Spartacus of death. And uh, it's super exciting. You know, I would love that for them too. So anything I can do to help them, I, I want to do that. And Greece showed up, like I said, I can only imagine how amazing we can be if we actually had a pool of women that could try out for the team um, and be a lot more organized. This was our first take. I think we, we have a lot of potential because we have a lot of heart. Let's talk a little bit about your background, Greek. Uh, you said you grew up here in the Philadelphia area. Um, first generation Greek? I'm first generation Greek, yes. And, and, and how are you keeping some of the, are you keeping some of the traditions alive? I am. Um, so my husband happens to be Greek and my children, Sofia, Lefteri, Costa, are Greek. Um, they, they're soccer players and uh, we keep the traditions with respect to, you know, family values, that family is important. And uh, our religion, you know, why we fast, why we do the things we do, why our Easter falls on a different date, and um, our culture, our language. Being a Greek American woman, um, obviously life is different for you than it was for your mother. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, my mother, you know, was an immigrant. So she, my father and her, um, were married until the day that my father passed away. And uh, it was all about marrying a Greek and having Greek children. And back then it was normal to just marry somebody to take care of you. Uh, my mother was, didn't have that way of thinking. She always told me, you have the advantage of speaking the language and going to school, do something with it. You can be anything you want to be and do anything you want to do. Um, and I did. I went to college, I went to law school, and um, I'm happy that I had somebody that inspired me like that. And how did, uh, being a first generation Greek American, how did it influence your life? Um, I definitely think um, it's a value for work ethic that's super important. Um, you know, we don't have the mentality that I, I say Greeks have in Greece. You know, Greece, Greeks in Greece think that Greek Americans are crazy because we work too much, that we rely on three weeks of vacation to regenerate ourselves. Um, so I definitely have a U.S.-based work ethic like my parents had. And um, just uh, the importance of family that, that other family members value when you go and you see them. And so when I go to Greece, the way my father used to do, I go and I see everybody. Even if I just knock on the door and show up, they appreciate it. Is there someone we should mention that may have influenced your life in growing up Greek? Well, it was definitely my parents in uh, two different ways. Um, and I would say they're a complete opposite, and I'm thankful that I have both of those qualities. Um, my father was a little bit of a gypsy in the sense that he kind of did what he wanted to do, lived life to the fullest, um, gave everything he had. You said, Gus, I like your watch. You said, oh, you like it here? Take it. You know, I'll get another one. Um, he fed all the homeless people, let them sleep on our couch growing up. And I'd say, hey, you know, aren't you worried they're going to kill us in the middle of the night? He's like, no, we gave them a warm place to sleep. I feed them. They would never do anything to us. So he was definitely exocardia. And my mother was the hardworking family, keep it together, mis patalas, don't go crazy. And they, they complimented each other. So I definitely see that in myself. Um, you know, the, the lawyer mom side of me is representative of my mother. And um, the roller derby, who cares about what other people think, live your life the way you want to live it comes from my dad, and I, I try to teach those values to my children. I think your dad, you, you mentioned earlier, um, there's a famous motto. That he says. Yeah. And I used to say to him, hey, dad, are we going to do this next year? And he'd say, and I used to think it was, you know, just, just wait until then, but it, it really wasn't. It was really about live life today to the fullest. Don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow and compromise or sacrifice today worrying about that because that's not guaranteed. So make it count. Make every moment count. Um, everything we've heard about you uh, points to a person that's on the go. Tell us about your life and what that's like for you, your daily life. My daily life uh, starts at 6.30 in the morning with three little kids, just like a regular mom uh, making breakfast and sending them off to school. And then when they're in school, I work as an attorney, um, which is pretty challenging and demanding. Um, to go back to what I was saying about being in the moment, when I'm with my children, everything gets shut off. I don't multitask. I focus on them, and that's very, very important. And in the middle of all that, I try to um, practice yoga. I've been practicing yoga for about six years consistently. Um, it kind of levels me out. It is my yin and my yang with roller derby. Um, and then roller derby is about two to three times a week for two hours 
uh, of practice, and then I skate outside anywhere from three to six miles a couple times a week. I'm tired just hearing this. Well, and then soccer, soccer games on the weekend because I've got more. my soccer players, yeah. <laughs> Um, and we have that Olympiacos Ike rivalry in my house a little bit. So, uh, yeah, that's my life. Summarize yourself in just a few words. Who are you? I'd say that I'm a driven empath. Um, that's crazy about my kids. Eleni, thank you for speaking with us today. We wish you all the best. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. For more information about sponsoring or viewing the interview series, visit the Greek American Heritage Society of Philadelphia.